Are you excited about Starlink and 5G? I'm excited about all technology, <laughs> always, because that's just who I am. <laughs> but yes, we are closely tracking Starlink and 5G that is going to impact the connectivity options for RVers and cruisers. And we're going to sh kind of share with you our personal take on it, since, you know, this is our day job. <laughs> So obviously, mobile internet for RVers and boaters has been our day job since, oh gosh, 2013. We've been at this a while. We've been on the road since 2006, connecting via satellites and cellular and Wi-Fi, as we have crisscrossed the country so many times. And so, of course, you know, from the professional standpoint, we are tracking Starlink very closely. I actually went back and looked. The first article we wrote about SpaceX's upcoming satellite constellation was all the way back in uh, 2005, so over six years ago, we started covering what's coming, when, and all the, the pluses and minuses and trade-offs of it. And of course, we've also been tracking 5G, too, since some of our very first 4G articles talked about, you know, ten, way, way back, talked about, and coming next, there will be 5G, and here it is, and here it is. So we track this stuff really closely professionally. But this video is going to be more our personal take on it and how it might impact our personal mobile internet setup, which has been for the last decade really focused around cellular. Now first, Starlink. Give us a quick recap of what it is. Let's. We have full videos on this and you can talk for hours on this, but I can, what is Starlink? I can and have talked for hours, but Starlink <laughs> is um, Elon Musk's, uh, SpaceX's a massive satellite constellation project where they're going to be putting up thousands of satellites. There's already well over a thousand in the Starlink constellation that are a lot closer to Earth than traditional geostationary satellites and can therefore provide a much faster, much lower latency and basically a very similar to what you would get with cable or fiber um, satellite internet connection, but it works pretty much anywhere with a catch, <laughs> so with some catches. <laughs> okay, so we have seen and we have answered so many questions on this in forums and groups and even our own channels and with our members is will Starlink be able to replace all the other mobile internet connectivity options that we're constantly chasing after? Will it be the one solution to rule, rule them, them all? all? <laughs> no, no, no. But Starlink is actually is very, we are excited about it because it can be a really great, um, you know, icing compliment. on the cake, complement to other ways online. It's not going to completely replace cellular. It's not going to replace Wi-Fi in some places. But in places where there is no good coverage other ways um, or slower coverage other ways, you know, Starlink is already delivering speeds over 100 megabits per second, and in some cases over 300 megabits per second. So ridiculous fast speeds, and it works in the middle of nowhere. In fact, it works better in the middle of nowhere than it will in a suburban or urban area. So that's one of the, the things you have to balance with that. The catches with it. So are we going to use Starlink ourselves? Now, obviously, because we track mobile internet, we will be getting Starlink as soon as we're eligible. We have been stationed in Florida throughout the pandemic, and it is not yet available for beta here yet. We are on the list. Yes. We will order one as soon as we can. But we do have members of our team over at the Mobile Internet Research Center who are further north than us and have been testing right. it for months and getting us all the data that we need to understand the technology itself, aside from all of the technical specs and yes. FCC filings and yeah. Elon tweets that you are constantly yeah. tracking. So, so, yeah, so we haven't personally gotten hands-on Starlink time yet because coverage has not rolled. As, a, as we speak, they just pushed into northern Texas, northern New Mexico and all that. So still a ways before they get to Florida, probably later in 2021, they'll have full coverage nationwide. So that's, you know, it's been a slow progress down. But we are excited. We will get it to test and play with. But there are some practical considerations for it. One, well, we, we travel a lot of the times in a van. And Starlink is a big system. And the Dishy, Dishy McFlatface is about, you know, a little bit over two feet across. And in a big RV, it's no big deal to throw that in a bay. It's very, very easy to set up. But in a van, that would take up a lot of our storage space. So it's something you'd have to consider. For It'd be a thing because not everywhere we go, we're going to get to that in a moment. Can you even rely on Starlink? Right. Which means we would still have to have our cellular set up, and that dish would probably sit in the van unused, unused most of the time. and in our way. So I'm skeptical of that, especially for small 
things. So let's get to coverage issues. There are coverage issues now because Starlink is in beta. The, it's, the constellation is still being launched, still being filled out, and Starlink is dependent upon ground stations to f actually get an internet connection, and that determines where they can turn on service. Yeah, so, well, and, and ground stations, so yeah, they, they have to be, be, you have to be in range of a satellite passing overhead, and that satellite has to be in range of a ground station. There's, in the future, in several years down the road, Starlink will actually be able to relay from satellite to satellite to satellite, and then it will, that's when they'll start covering oceans and really, really remote places. But there will be enough ground stations um, pretty soon to cover the entire United States anyway. Um, so that's not the big issue in the United States, but the, the other big issue with coverage is they only have a certain amount of capacity. You know, you think of the satellite flying overhead, it's like a cell tower passing overhead, and it has a cell on the ground, essentially, that it is serving, and there's only so much capacity per cell. And so out in the boonies, well, no problem, no problem at all, but in suburban and urban areas, um, those cells can get congested and overloaded. The system will slow down. And at the moment, Starlink, SpaceX, even if you're in an area where your neighbor has gotten Starlink, if they're at capacity, they'll tell you, nope, nope, no more service in that area. You've got to wait for either to get more capacity in the area right. or someone to leave the service. Yeah. Now, have any of you ever been to like Quartzsite or Yuma <laughs> or Claremont, Florida in the winter and experienced what happens to the cellular towers during those times? We get non-stop reports from people in those locations and we've been there ourselves mm -hmm. of I can't stream Netflix at night what's happening yeah. I got great signal why can't I stream Netflix <laughs> that's that tower capacity yeah. issue and that same thing is going to exist if you get a whole bunch of Starlink customers in the same area which our viewers we all tend to like to get together <laughs> in some of the same areas. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, so these capacity issues are going to be real in places like Quartzsite and stuff. It's going to take a while for SpaceX to get, even once they have coverage, to get enough satellites that they can handle a lot of people in small groups of areas. And they're already saying, like some, some addresses, if you try to sign up for Starlink service where they've rolled it out, there's some addresses that are already coming up saying, we're not going to have service. We might not ship your Starlink to your address until late 2022. So this is still in the beta period, beta is going to be going on through at least the summer, and they're already saying late 2022 for some areas. So again, this is this is going to be a catch, and then well, so the mobility catches. The mobility. So right now, Starlink is not officially authorized Mobi for mobility. And when they're talking about mobility, what they have filed for with the FCC is actually using the service while in motion, which as RVers, <laughs> we don't really care about. If we have our cell phone working as we're driving down the road, getting our cell navigation, maybe checking yeah. the passenger, checking email and keeping on top of whatever work is going on, that's great. But when we get to our campsite, we're okay setting up whatever <laughs> our mobile internet solution is, getting it optimized right. and then being connected then. So we're not looking for in motion mobility yep. with Starlink. We're all looking for portability. Can we move that dish yeah. from one location to our next location and, and have it work? Yeah, and this is something Starlink has just in the last few weeks turned on is making portability easier because now they let you basically change your service address. It's not automatic. You have to go to the customer service portal, put in your new address, and it takes about 20 minutes for the service to turn off at your old address and turn on at your new address because right now Starlink doesn't it's tied to fixed location addresses because it's the current target is fixed rural um, residential installs but mobility is coming yes uh, they have filed for official mobility licenses where, yeah. and that would allow and their software will get more up to date so that when you move your your service it will automatically be able to update the location hopefully and be and you don't have to go through this ah oh, do i have service at my next location do i right. switch it now do i switch it when i get there well i have cellular service to even get online yeah. to up update my address yeah. when i get there so there's a lot of concerns right now and of course limited ability across the country right so this this is where, where the mobility really matters because when you're doing a portable system with an rv you just take it up set it up and, and it's on the ground and you're just at a new location you change your location you're good to go but on our boat if we want to use starlink on our boat you're in motion always there even, even a boat at the dock <laughs> is still rocking so until they get the mobility working and able to respond to motions like this because right now starlink shuts down if you move it too much um then it will only then will it matter for our boats so maybe late by fall maybe we'll be able to have so starlink exciting on boat. mobility okay. is kind of there now it is coming they <laughs> fully Elon has used the R and the B word, RV and boat, yes. <laughs> uh, multiple times in tweets. It is fully on their radar. It is coming. Um, it may require some slight modifications to the equipment to deal with the in-motion yeah. stuff. We, see. we shall see. So no guarantees that the Starlink stuff you buy today will be the Starlink that is mobile, but also no guarantees that it won't. You know, Elon Musk has said that it might Elon actually be Elon. the stuff. But uh, <laughs> okay. shade. <laughs> well, let's talk about once you get to your location. <laughs> right. 
you cannot depend upon Starlink giving you a connection at a new location. Uh, outside of those congestion issues, outside of them having service in that area, you have to be concerned with having a massive amount of clear line of sight to the sky. This isn't like geostationary satellites like a lot of long-time RVers are used to with HughesNet or Viasat. Or satellite TV. Yeah. Uh, where you just have to find where the satellite is, aim through the trees, and you have a stationary point beam to that satellite. These satellites are moving right. through the sky and the, the satellite dish, Dishy McBlackface, has to be able to track those satellites right. throughout the sky. So, so the way Starlink works is, um, you know, the Dishy doesn't move much once it's initially set up. It will go and aim to a quadrant of the sky, but then it is tracking the satellites passing overhead and they're going very, very quickly overhead. And um, that means no poking through the trees, no quick aiming, any obstructions will mean a dropout in service. And the Starlink app, and you can actually use the app even if you're not a customer yet, will let you bring up an augmented reality view to check the sky where you're at and see, are there obstructions? Is there a building? Is there a tree? Is there something else? Or is there shade that will result in dropouts? And it takes a huge slice of sky, mostly the northern sky in North America, for Starlink to work. And we, we've actually tested like, you know, great campground like this. You want to you want to be able to camp in the shade and well, Starlink, the, the dish comes with a hundred foot cable. So you maybe can get it set up on a tripod somewhere a hundred feet away from you. But even in this entire campground, we walked around through it. We found one spot in this entire campground where it is a hundred percent clear on the Starlink AR tracker for the dishy to actually work without dropouts due to obstruction. So keep in mind, yeah, there, I've got, you know, if I'm low enough, oh, there's a little bit of a tree there, but no, mostly, mostly got this, this spot is clear. Yeah, but you're right next to the dumpster and the bathhouse and the campground host. And, oh, and, and, and right no across, shade. no shade, and also the housing development is right there. So it's also the worst spots in the campground. <laughs> but there is one spot. So that's so a problem. That is going to be a consideration. If you like to camp in places with things around you, like trees, mountains, rocks, terrain, in <laughs> ravines, or places that might block this view of the sky, you're blocking the view of Starlink too. Yeah, and, and so so for a lot of stuff, that's fine. You know, oh, it dropped out for 45 seconds, um, you know, a couple times an hour. But if you're on a Zoom call, dropping out for 45 seconds might mean, you know, you might end up getting fired for, you know. You know might you know, lose a some, deal. You might, yeah. if you're like a, doing telehealth, yes. uh, if you're either a patient so, or a doctor, so, you could really cause so, a stressful situation. So, so Starlink will be getting a lot better once there's multiple satellites in the sky. As long as there's, you know, one passes behind a tree, maybe you can go to a backup satellite really quickly. You know, so there's, it's going to be getting a lot better, but there are tricks. It gets, gets, it's also going to be complicated and particularly in a forested place, Starlink will be a very, very hard, it will struggle. Okay, so next you might be saying, well, that's okay. <laughs> I plan to camp places with wide open skies so because I, I am focused on solar power and off-grid <laughs> power. So I'm going to be in places with wide open sky, no shade anyway. Yeah, okay. Here's your problem with that. So, so Starlink <laughs> is, you know, it, it uses a lot more power than cellular. So you know, you're talking to satellites, you're using basically military grade antenna technology that is so, so cutting edge, but it uses a lot of electricity. So about 100 to maybe 150 watts of power while Starlink is turned on and connected. So you could of course turn it off at night or something when you're not using it, but that's a lot of power if you're off grid, off battery. So something you definitely have to keep in mind it's way, way more power than a cellular connection would now, use. Now, hopefully they can make do better with that in the future, and they know that is an yep. issue for off-grid <laughs> applications. Rural customers who are living on solar also have this concern. So these are things that will hopefully be addressed <laughs> in the future, but they are considerations now. Um, so what this all means for us personally is we see Starlink is probably going to be an awesome tool set in our mobile internet yeah. arsenal. It is probably not going to replace everything else that we have, no. we're probably still going to be using cellular when we're in trees, when we're camped near major cities or in congested and areas. In, in the van in particular, Starlink's not going to make sense to travel with the van, but when we're out desert boondocking, it will be amazing. It, eventually when it works on a boat, it will be great. There'll be places where it'll be so nice to go from, you know, getting slow five megabits or 10 megabits on cellular, turn on Starlink and 100 megabits, 200 megabits, that'll be amazing. But it's not gonna be our only way online. It's not the be all end all. So we're excited, but we're also realistic. Okay, so 
since we still have to think about cellular now, we can't just, Elon's not going to solve all of our dreams. We still need 5G. <laughs> 5G is what is being, has been being rolled out by all of the carriers across the world. And specifically here in the U.S., the state of 5G is reaching mainstream. Like the launch of the iPhone 12 last year kind of took it to a really mainstream area. Uh, most flagship smartphones now on the market include it. Tablets are coming out with it routers and hotspots are out and antennas are out. All the components that make up most people's mobile internet arsenal, the tools are starting to come out. Does that mean you should buy them now? Yeah, yeah so we are still in early days of the 5G networks. Um, you know, basically what 5G does is it's going to pave the next pave the way for the next decade of cellular evolution. But it's like it's like a, a relay race and the 4G is passing the baton. So really good 4G is where 5G starts and then we'll go for the next 10 years. But that means 5G where it is stands today in most places is not much better than 4G and actually in quite a few places, particularly on AT&T and Verizon, 5G is slower than 4G. So we're at this weird transition period of, yeah, 5G is, is, is great. There's a lot of exciting future stuff happening, um, but you don't necessarily need to rush out and be all about 5G. We are excited. We're, we've got some 5G gear. We've just got the Hepwave Max Transit 5G, so one of the, the first 5G cellular integrated routers. But um, it's still, you know, we're, it's still in its infancy. <laughs> it's this infancy. router will probably be obsolete in a, in, within a year, yeah. in a lot of ways. Just with the way that 5G is constantly evolving. Uh, Verizon in particular just want a whole bunch of mid-band spectrum that is going to be carving the majority of their 5G network, which yeah, so, is going to impact the technology that yeah. has to be used to support it. Yeah, so all this new stuff will be coming. You know, Verizon and AT&T's networks in particular, they're going to be changing around a lot of what they do with 5G come the end of 2021, the beginning of 2022. T-Mobile is kind of in the lead right now because they've got a kind of a spectrum advantage. Um, they can get, they've got some really cool 5G stuff now. But again, it's still early days. So yeah, we are very excited about 5G. I, I love the vision of a future of, of 5G plus Starlink, I'm going to have crazy fast speeds in cellular areas and still crazy fast speeds when we go out in the really remote areas. So very excited for the future, but it's a little bit down the road. So at this point, our 5G advisement is don't hesitate to, if you're ready for a smartphone upgrade, don't hesitate to go with a 5G model. <laughs> Great. Don't hesitate. Um, maybe even with some of the mobile hotspots that are coming out, the personal ones, they're yeah. kind of priced high though. They're yeah. going to come down in price yeah. and time. Better, faster, cheaper will be available um, next year. If you're optimizing for routers, maybe you don't quite go with the 5G router yet, but you start thinking about the antennas that you're putting and installing mm -hmm. on your roof to support the sub-6 5G frequency spectrums that will become important yeah. as 5G rolls out. That way, the difficult part of your installation is future-proofed. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of considerations around all of this. Uh, this is just <laughs> so high level. If you go over to our mobile internet resource our center, site. <laughs> the, uh, the, we have a YouTube channel and the website as well, uh, where you can dive in as deep as you want to go with this stuff. We are probably putting out content a couple times a month as this stuff is constantly shifting. It is keeping us working really hard these days. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, but it is fun. We, we, man, partly why we got into doing this for our job is because we love geeking out, playing on the cutting edge of technology and um, having fun with all this stuff. So exciting yay cool but that's yeah. it <laughs> um, maybe we'll have an update someday on maybe Our we'll have personal a, setups <laughs> maybe well yeah so who knows we're still kind of using the same setup that we documented this time last year as our default um so if you want to go check out what we use go to technomadia.com slash internet uh, keep that article updated as we change out any components as we go along but uh mostly everything's still same old same old Stay connected. No retiring, huh? No retiring. Too much to track. Oh. <laughs> okay. We create these videos just for fun, and we love having you along for the ride. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, or if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. See you next time.